Hi everyone. I'm here in Chapter 4 of the Course Packet, which is on the use of grouping variables and regression models. And in this video, uh, we're going to give a high-level overview of some of the major concepts that we'll encounter in this chapter. Uh, and specifically, uh, we will start thinking about multiple predictors in a regression model. That is, many different x's that can all be used to forecast uh, the same y, the same outcome variable. Uh, in this chapter, the special case that we'll consider of that general scenario, lots of x is one y, will be when only one of those x variables, those predictors, is a numerical variable, and the rest are all categorical, they're all grouping variables. And we'll, we'll move on from there pretty rapidly, but that scenario, one numerical variable and potentially lots of grouping uh, variables as predictors, uh, can get at a lot of the important concepts here. Uh, and so to sort of introduce this idea, we're going to use one of our favorite data sets so far. This is the data set on graduating GPA uh, for the University of Texas students entering class of 2000. Uh, and so what we see from this box plot right here is a, a noticeable trend uh, in which graduating GPA is correlated with the college in which a student is taking his or her degree. Architecture, for example, tends to have higher average graduating GPAs than education or engineering or nursing, for example. Uh, and while there is still a, a large amount of within-group variation, a lot of unexplained variation by this uh, single categorical predictor, nonetheless, there are some systematic differences among the colleges, uh, and any kind of model that we're going to build for graduating GPA probably ought to take these differences into account. Uh, at the same time, if we go to the next page, a student's own SAT score is also a strong, uh, well, I shouldn't say strong, but at least a moderate predictor of graduating GPA. And we can see that in the scatter plot right here and the positive slope of the straight line fit. Again, every dot here is a student, and that student's combined SAT score, math plus verbal, uh, is on the x-axis and graduating GPA on the y-axis right here. Uh, and so if we're interested in building a model for GPA, you know, here's two obvious candidate variables. What college a student was enrolled in, which we saw predicts GPA, at least weekly, uh, and what that student's SAT score was, which we can see from this plot, also predicts GPA. So how would we build a model that takes both of those predictors into account? Well, probably the simplest way, if we page over the, to the next figure here, uh, is to think about slicing and dicing, or simply disaggregating the data set into the 10 different groups that we saw in the very first plot. Uh, and so there's actually two sets of lines within each panel of this lattice plot right here, uh, and we're going to focus on the blue lines first. Okay, so let's remind ourselves. The lattice plot, uh, it shows the same set of numerical variables, in this case graduating GPA on the y-axis and combined SAT score on the x-axis, uh, for subsets of a larger data set. In this case, the subsets are the 10 undergraduate colleges. Uh, and the y-axis and x-axis are the same in each plot, uh, and each dot within each panel corresponds to a student in that specific college. So let's focus, there's two sets of lines, blue and red. Let's focus on the blue lines first. They're a lot easier to understand. All we've done to fit the blue lines here and to incorporate both college and SAT score as a predictor of GPA is to fit a separate least squares line to each subset of the data implied by all 10 of these undergraduate colleges. So in other words, we took architecture as its own independent data set and we fit a straight line. We got that blue line right there. We took business as a second independent data set. We fit a straight line by least squares. We got that blue line right there and so on. Independent data set for communications, for education, for engineering, all the way down to social work. Uh, and those blue lines, you can see, uh, because we're treating each data, each subset as if it were its own independent data set, it has a different slope. Uh, it's obvious, for example, that the slope here for education is steeper than the slope for nursing. Uh, and they also have different intercepts. For example, there's the blue line with an intercept uh, hitting the y-axis here below uh, 2.5, uh, whereas the communications intercept is much higher. It's hitting the y-axis here uh, round about I don't know, 2.7, something like that, closer to 3. Uh, so those 10 lines, they all have different slopes and different intercepts, and it's pretty obvious how we would fit that. Just slice and dice, 10 different least squares fits. You'll notice, however, that the blue lines have a, at least for one college, have a, a very uh, strange feature. Uh, and, and if your eyes are drawn to this blue line over here in the College of Social Work, uh, good job. 
you notice that the slope is negative over here for the College of Social Work. And that, that seems uh, like a, a strange feature uh, of the least squares line between SAT score and GPA. Uh, you would imagine uh, just a priori, knowing nothing about the data here, that a higher SAT score would probably predict a higher GPA, at least on average, and that seems not to be the case for social work. So what's going on here? Uh, this is almost certainly an artifact of sampling variability. We've got a very small sample size in the College of Social Work, uh, you know, nine or ten students right here, and probably just by chance, uh, you know, the vagaries of those students' own experiences in college, uh, we ended up with a negative slope. Doesn't mean we would get a negative slope next year. Doesn't mean we would get a negative slope if we aggregated data for social work across a decade. It's just for this particular year, for these particular small group of students, we got a negative slope. Uh, and that's weird. Right? That's a, a, a very uh, strange conclusion to draw that for students in the College of Social Work, the higher SAT score would predict a lower GPA. Uh, and, and that points to one potential uh, downside of this slice and dice approach to incorporating both of the variables at once. In other words, you, you disaggregate or slice on the grouping variable, and then within each subset, you fit a separate model. And that transparently takes into account both the grouping variable and the quantitative variable of SAT score in building the model for GPA. The downside is that if you've got some groups that have relatively small sample sizes, their estimates can be highly variable and wildly out of sync with some of the other groups. And so that's, that's, uh, that's quite general. And we see that phenomenon demonstrated very clearly here at the College of Social Work. And that's where the red lines come in. That's where the red lines come in. So the red lines, let me first point out that they all have different intercepts. They are subtly different intercepts, but you can clearly see, for example, uh, within communications, the red line hitting the y-axis above 2.5. Uh, and over here in uh, engineering, the red line hitting the y-axis below 2.5. So they do have different intercepts, and that reflects the fact that some of the point clouds are, uh, are shifted systematically up relative to the others in, these, in this panel, and others like engineering are shifted systematically down. However, if you were to carefully get out your rulers and, and you know compute delta y over delta x for each of these red lines, which I, I don't recommend that you do, it would be pretty tedious. So just trust me on this count. They all have exactly the same slopes. So social work has the same slope as nursing, has the same slope as communications, has the same slope as architecture. Uh, and that has a, a, from the standpoint of the social work line that we saw over here, that has a positive effect uh, in terms of what our expectations for this this data set would show. And we end up getting a positive slope for the relationship between SAT score and GPA. And the, the reasoning here is that because we see in all of the other nine undergraduate colleges that there's a, a positive relationship, as we would expect and as the data bore out, uh, we're sort of allowing that recognition of a positive relationship in all nine of these other colleges to sort of overrule the small sample size in social work. In other words, we end up borrowing some information to estimate the social work line from all nine of these undergraduate colleges. So there's a couple of questions there that, that, are, uh, that, that this, uh, the difference between the red and the blue lines motivate. Question one is, which set of lines is better? Should we have the red lines uh, that have different intercepts but a common slope across all 10 undergraduate colleges? Or should we have the blue lines that have different intercepts and different slopes. And if you're counting parameters there, 10 undergraduate colleges, the, uh, the blue lines, they involve 20 parameters, right? Because there's 10 intercepts and 10 slopes to estimate. Whereas the red lines involve 11 parameters. There's 10 intercepts to estimate, one per college, but a single common slope. That's 11 parameters across all 10 colleges. Uh, so you can see there's kind of a, an advantage in terms of parsimony for the red lines. There's fewer parameters, and you end up having a, a simpler, uh, less uh, highly parameterized model for the data. That's one possible advantage. Um, and, and you know, in the case of social work, we can see that you would kind of get the sensible answer as opposed to the, the nonsense answer in the case of the red lines. So for this particular data set, you might end up preferring the red to the blue because you know there's kind of this uh, this Borrowing of information effect for social work leads you to, to get the sensible answer. Uh, 
But as a general principle, the question is, how would we end up choosing for data sets where we've got a grouping variable, college, and a, and a numerical predictor, SAT score, how would we choose the difference between the red and the blue lines as a general matter? Which one is better? That's an important question. The second question is more of a, a methodological question, a nuts and bolts, like how do we do this question? How would we even use the principle of least squares to fit the red lines here? Uh, it's obvious how we got the blue. We pit treated these as 10 independent data sets and fit them 10 straight lines to each data set independently. Uh, it's not at all obvious, unless you've sort of read ahead here, how we would use the principle of least squares to somehow constrain the slopes of the red lines to be the same across all 10 panels and yet have different intercepts for all of those 10 lines. So in this chapter, we will learn a technique called, or a, a sort of uh, a approach to, uh, to encoding information about grouping variables. Uh, it's called the dummy variable approach. And we will see how introducing the idea of dummy variables allows us to answer both questions. It's a rich, flexible way of incorporating grouping information into regression models. And it points the way towards an answer to both questions of how we would choose which sets of lines are better for this data set and for other similar types of data sets. And if we decided that the red lines were better, how we would even go about fitting those red lines with a constrained common slope across all 10 groups using the principle of least squares.